So um, this series that I decided to do um, was really because I felt that we should explore some of the important women throughout our history. And um, who better to start with than Chava, the woman, the mother of all mankind, the first ever woman in the world. But it's interesting because as the first ever woman, um, if you look at the simple text of Peshat, there's not really that much information that we have about her. Um, there's very little uh, details about her life. Um, we only really know about the bad things that she did, which was obviously the eating from the wrong tree. We don't really know much else about her, only if we sort of delve a bit deeper, which is when I was preparing for the year, I was fascinated by what I found out about her um, and also about the relationship that her and Adam, her and Adam, that they, they shared. So I thought I just wanted to share a few of the ideas that I came across and that hopefully can teach us something. I think the tagline of the year was, you know, um, modern messages from our sort of ancestors. And that's really what um, Chava can teach us. So um, let's get started. So first of all, Source number one. Source number one teaches us the basics about Chava. Um, we're told in source number one, source number one comes from the book of Bereshit, um, chapter two. And we're told that Vayushnehim Arumim, and they were both naked, man and woman. They both have, well, she hasn't got a name yet. She is just called Ishto, his wife. They were naked and they felt no shame. What is this issue about not feeling any shame? Why does the Torah specifically say that she, they felt no shame? So Rashi in source number two that we can see that underlines it, it says, let's read the English quickly. It says that Adam gave names to all the creatures and yet the evil inclination did not become an active principle in him until he had eaten of the tree. When it entered into him and he became aware of the difference between good and evil. Basically, Adam and Eve at this point were totally pure of spirit. There was no need to cover themselves with any clothing because there was no idea of lewdness or indecency. And with every fiber of their being, they were doing things to connect to God in a totally spiritual, spiritually, spiritual way. They were totally and utterly pure. There was no differentiation really between physicality, the body and spirituality, the soul. They were all totally one. And then we see that the Nachash, the snake, was able to worm his way in into Chava's psyche and convince Chava, who actually was not called Chava yet, we're going to see that soon, that she should defy the one commandment that God had given them, which was obviously not to eat from this forbidden tree. And have we ever really stopped to question how she could possibly do this? How is it possible that somebody who we just saw before was totally naked? She was so pure and spiritual that she could walk around the Garden of Eden without clothes on, but yet she could be persuaded by a snake to eat from the one thing that she was not able to eat from, right? It sounds a bit bizarre if we really take a second and think about how it was possible that she did this. It was a little now, weird. Pardon? I don't know, I oh, okay. Now, that's our first question. Number one is, how could she have done this? How is it possible that this cover, this first woman of the world, could sin in such a way? Second question we have, look now at source number three. Source number three tells us about her name. It says, Lizot Ikra Isha. She was called woman, Kima Ish Lukacha Zot. She was called a woman because from the man she was taken. Now, if we look at the next source, we see her name is being changed. Because she was the mother of all living things. So what happens between chapter two and chapter three, between source three and source four, what happens? That's the sin. In between these two sources is where the sin takes place. So our question is, why at this juncture does, do we see her name change? Why is it specifically after she sinned that Adam gives her a new name called Chava? Before, before the sin happens, she's just called Isha. Only afterwards is her name changed. So that is our two main questions that we're gonna be grappling with today. So first of all, let's take the second question first. The second question is why was her name changed at this juncture? What is the significance of her name being changed at this specific moment? And I think it's interesting because when Ha'isha, when this woman convinces Adam 
eating from the tree. And then we see that Adam does not own up to the mistake in front of God. And we know that this has looked very badly upon by everybody. We're told that God says, where are you? And he doesn't even say. And the one thing he does to his credit is that he does not blame Chava by screaming and shouting at her. Now let's take, take it in like modern day terms. Can you imagine if somebody did a sin like this and they basically changed the whole of humanity, they basically changed the whole world. Adam could have easily have said, I can't believe you made me do this screaming and shouting. I can't believe this has happened. I can't believe you made this mistake. And he basically could have blamed everything on her screaming and shouting and being horrible. But what does he choose to do instead? He chooses at this particular moment to give her a compliment. He chooses at the moment of crisis to focus on her good qualities, on the good things that she does, on being the mother of all humanity. Now, although this year really is about what we can learn from Chava, the woman, I think it's too much of a good opportunity to pass up looking at this particular sort of a moment itself in a bit more detail. Because it teaches us to focus on the good in the people in our lives. May it be a spouse or may it be our parents or may it be our children or our friends. Adam chooses to focus on the good part of her. And even though she had sinned, this is the name that we all refer to her as. We, are, we all know Chava as Chava. We all know her as the M Kochai, the mother of all people, not as Haisha, not as the woman she was before the sin, but we know her as the name that Adam chose to compliment her. And it shows and emphasizes to us that we have to look at the good in people, that this is why her name was changed at this specific moment because Adam chose, even though she had sinned, he chose to name her a positive name. And I think also it's interesting because she's called Haisha, this colloquial woman name. And really Haisha could be any one of us. It could be any of us, it could be all of us. Haisha is just a general name for a woman. And I think it's also symbolic of the fact that although we are not in a situation that she was in, we you know with eating from the tree, we all face challenges throughout our lives and we all sometimes slip up just like Haisha, just like the woman. And I think that the fact that she was just Haisha, not a specific person when she sinned, is there to teach us how we can all look to her as an example. So that's looking at Adam's perspective, how he chose to focus on her positive qualities throughout the time, even though she had sinned, and even though she changed the world forever. However, we can also flip it to the other side. And we can say that like Chava, we should surround ourselves with people who make us feel like Chava, who make us feel like Adam felt towards Chava. We should surround ourselves with people, a network of people who focus on our good qualities and make us feel positive about ourselves because we all make mistakes. It's true, we all do, we all do bad things. We're human beings and we try and rectify and we try to be better people. But ultimately, we sometimes we slip up and therefore we should, we, we should be, have an Adam in our lives. We should have somebody, whoever it may be, who's there to support us and to back us up and to give us a compliment when we sometimes need it. So this is the answer to the first question. Question number one is, why was the name changed then? And the answer is because it is symbolic of the fact that yes, she sinned, but we should not be focusing only on the negative in people, but we should be focusing on the positive in people that we associate with. Now let's move on to the sin itself. So as children, I'm sure all of you will agree, we are all told that the first sin of mankind was to, that they ate from this forbidden fruit, whatever it was, some say an apple, some commentators say it was wheat or barley, all different kinds of things. But really, there was actually a sin or really there was a mitzvah that they failed to do before they actually did this official sin. Now let's have a look quickly at source number five. So source number five, so let's scroll down a bit, um, comes from, again, from Bereshit. And it says, Vayetzav Hashem Elohim al Adam, And God commanded the man saying, Mikol eitz hagan achol tochel. Of every tree of the garden, you are free to eat. They were commanded to eat from all the trees to partake in all God's delicious bounty and to enjoy the world of physicality that he has granted them. Yet, Chava did not do that. She failed to understand that as human beings, we have to partake 
partake in the physical world that we are living in, that we are meant to enjoy that what we have been blessed with, with. And then we are meant to use all that physicality to connect to God. And she didn't do that. The first thing she did wrong, actually, was by not enjoying the good things that God had given her, by not partaking of the other trees before she actually did the sin that we all know that she did. Now, keep that in the back of our minds, because that will help us to understand Chava and her motivations a bit more in a minute. So then we have the sin. Then we have the sin that we all know. She eats from the forbidden trees. But really, why on earth did she do it? As we just saw, she could have eaten from every single other tree, plant, bush, whatever she wanted, she could have done. Could she really not have resisted this one tree? What was it about it? So let's have a look now at source number six. Source number six is um, the snake, the nachash, this like evil, uh, you know, the Yitzhahara, the devil that comes along and says, basically, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree because, as it says here, ki yodea elokim, ki beyom achaltem, the day that you will eat from the trees, your eyes will be open and you will be ka elokim, like divine beings who know the difference between good and bad. Basically, the snake comes along and says, so we were just asking the question, looking at source number six, and we were saying, is it really possible that Chava thought that she would become like a god by eating from this fruit? So now we're going to look at source number seven. Source number seven, Chizkuni, one of the commentators on the Torah. And he says, if you just look at the underlined few words, he, he says that, no, no, no. It's not that you are going to be like God. You, she knew she wasn't going to become a deity, but she believed that by attaining this knowledge, by eating from this fruit, she would become kamalchim, like an angel. What was it about angels that she wanted to be like? Why did she desire to be like an angel so much? she just become a human. Why does she want to suddenly leave that and become an angel? And there's a phrase actually that comes from a book, and I can't remember who the author is. If anyone knows, please let me know. I have someone on my bookshelf. It's called Angels Don't Leave Footprints. And this is basically the whole reason behind why Chava wanted to eat from the tree. Angels are given one specific task. We see from last week's Pasha, Pasha Vayera, that there were three angels that were sent. Each one would give, was given a specific goal. One goal was to, was to tell um, Avraham about destroying Saddam. One was to tell them about the birth of Yitzchak. And one was to tell them or to heal about the Brit. Each angel has a specific job. And the angels stay on their path and they cannot move left or right. And we even see that from Yaakov and his ladder. The angels, when Yaakov has his dream, the angels are going up and down, up and down, coming up and down in his dream. They're not able to veer away from the assignment that they've been given. They can't leave footprints because they can't make an impact of their choosing. They, they have to do the mission, the job that they were assigned to do. This was what Chava was trying to stop and what she was trying to really sort of deal with by eating from the, by, from the fruit. She was worried about the responsibility that came with being a mere human being. She didn't want to be like God, but by eating from the tree, she hoped that her life would become easier, that she would have, wouldn't have to make any life decisions, that she would be able to just stay on one specific path. But she failed to understand that it's only through making the decisions that we make in life and through balancing all the physicality and the spirituality and making the day-to-day -day judgments that we make every single day that us as human beings are able to achieve greatness. We're not, we're the only way that we are able to make an impact unlike the angels is because of the challenges that are put in front of us and because of the decisions that we, are, that we have to make. And this is possibly why also Chava did not eat from all the other trees that she was able to eat. Remember we said a few sources ago that she was able to eat from all the other trees, but she didn't because she couldn't deal with balancing the spirituality and the physicality, trying to take the physicality, the food, the fruit that was around her and elevate it and make it into something that could connect her to God. She wanted a much easier life. Now Chava, is called Em Kol Chai. As we saw before, um, when Adam named her, he 
says, and you're going to be called Chava because you are the mother of all living things. Now, it's weird, but I actually never thought of this question until I was researching for this year. But why is Adam not called the father of all living things? Right? I never thought of that question before. I never thought of it. Why is Chava called the mother of living things? And she's, and he is not sort of given any sort of title like that at all. And Rav Zilberstein, who um, lives in Israel, he was born in 1934, is actually a, a big medical postig, deals with lots of medical um, questions and shilas. And he explains, and I'm going to say this twice, but it's a very deep um, concept. And it took me a few seconds to, to really take it in. Rav Zilberstein explains that the act or an act is attributed to a person who experiences difficulty in achieving it. So that an act is attributed to a person who experiences difficulty to achieve it. And as we know, Chava from now on was going to experience the physical, emotional, every other pain that comes from pregnancy, childbirth, child rearing, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore she was given the honor of being called the mother of all humanity. Whereas Adam didn't have that physical connection to childbirth that, that she did. And therefore that's why he was not called the father of all humanity, whereas she was called the mother of humanity. And it made me think of a story because um, if you think about going back, you know, taking tests in school or whatever it was, if you worked really hard, you owned it. It felt like, you know, if you worked really hard and then you did really well on the test, you, it felt like you deserved it and you felt like it was a part of you and you'd sort of overcome this challenge. And I remember when I was in um, secondary school, I was just, I got my, we just did our A-levels and um, I was very excited. I went to, oh, very nervous, first of all, I went to go pick up my A-levels with my parents. Then I went with my friend and me and my friends, we both got three A's. At that time, there was no A-stars. So we were very delighted. We got the best we could have got. Um, and we were really happy. We both got into universities we wanted to go to. And we went out for lunch to celebrate me and my, my friends and I. And I remember she said to me during lunch, said, I'm so happy for, for myself, as in her, that she got her three A's. I'm even happier for you that you got your three A's. And I was like, what? It's a very selfless thing to say. And she's like, no. She goes, look, for me, I didn't really work that hard. You saw me. I was out all the time. I, I like, didn't really. I, I, I was just lucky. I did, I did a bit of work and I was lucky. I, I liked the questions on the test. So, but you, we never saw you for months and months and months because you were studying so hard. And anyone that knows me knows that was me. I studied all the time, revising all the time. And they, I, it was a huge struggle for me, my, my exams. I worked so, so hard for them. And therefore... Once I had achieved it, achieved it, my friend was saying really what, what Rob Zilberstein says, that act becomes part of me much more than it became part of her because she didn't really have to struggle for it. She just got the A's very nice. She moved on with her life. For me, it was like a defining moment of my life. I managed to get my results. And this really changes our whole mindset and reframes how we look at work. And again, links in with the idea that we just spoke about. Because Chava was so worried about the hard work it would entail to be a mere mortal, just to be a human being, not to be an angel, to have to make decisions, to do the work that is actually required to be a successful and fulfilled and worth worthy human being. And then the snake who represents the Yetzirah really in all of us, this like little devil on our shoulder, he convinces her that the easy way is the better way. The easy way is the preferred way. And I think the story is symbolic for all of us. And this is a message that we can take, bring into our modern day lives, is that we all have this Yetzirah, this Nachash, this snake, this little devil on our shoulder that tells her, that tells us the easy way sometimes is the better way. That, you know, it's sometimes easier to do this, but the harder way we know will be more fulfilling and actually will be, will be better for us. Sometimes, you know, the alarm clock goes off and we know that we really should just get up and go to work or get up and we can be with our kids or get up and we'll be able to have time to dive in. But what do we do? We roll over the snake in our head or the, you know, the, the evil inclination says, no, five more minutes won't make a difference. It's easy, it's easy. But really we know when push comes to shove, the better thing to do is just to get up right away and get on with our day. And ultimately the snake is also a symbol of a lack of patience. She Chava wanted things right away. She didn't want to have to work to have to become this great person. She wanted to eat from the fruit 
and become amazing. She wanted just like, you know, she wanted to wake up one morning and lose a hundred pounds. She wanted to wake up one morning and suddenly have a doctorate. She wanted everything to be right away. And this, I think, also is a message, especially I talk to myself more than anyone of our generation. You know, we're so used to immediate. I mean, Amazon Prime, when I order my Amazon just now, it said it's not going to come until Sunday. And I was like, what? How can it come Sunday? It's Wednesday. What's going on? Why not tomorrow? So we want everything straight away. The worst thing is when you see just now when the connection went down, the, the circle is going round and round and round, reconnecting. And you're like, why? Come, hurry up, hurry up. I want it right now. We, our generation was so used to things happening right away. And we have a desire to see the results now. But Chava teaches us, and she learns really the hard way, it takes a huge amount of hard work and effort and persistence to get the results that we want to see. And we actually see this even more so with the punishment that she got. What was the punishment? The punishment was pregnancy, it was childbirth. And it used to be before she received the punishment that you literally, the, the conception, the pregnancy and the childbirth, childbirth would have been immediate. There would have been no waiting. But now with the punishment, we see that there's a huge amount of struggle. There's a huge amount of patience that, that, take, that it takes. Once you are able to conceive, you have to wait nine months, please go for the baby. And then once you are reached on your term, you then have to wait for the, you know, the epidural to kick in if, if you have to, well, and then you've got to wait for the labor to start. And it's a huge amount of patience that it takes in order for these for, for childbirth to come. And it's a process that requires patience. And this is something that Chava did not have and did not possess at this moment. And that's exactly why the punishment that she got really fitted for her and her personality. So from Chava, I think we learn a variety of things, even though, as I said before, many of these things are not shut. They're not things that we would just learn from the text. And many of these things I really had not even thought about until I was pre preparing for the year. First of all, we learn how not to behave. We learn that to understand that to get the results that we want, it, it's a process. We have to work to get them. Things don't happen immediately. We can't just eat from the fruit and expect things to happen straight away. We have to work hard in order to get the results that we want. But we also see how we should look like Adam looked at Chava, we, how Adam looked for the good in Chava, we should also look for the good in other people. We should, we should constantly be focusing on being the kind of friend that Adam was and flipping it around the other way. We should look to surround ourselves with a support network of people who make us feel like Chava, that make us feel that even though we make mistakes, it's okay. It's okay to make a mistake because we're human beings and we'll pick ourselves up and even though Chava made a terrible mistake, life went on and humanity can talk about patience and talk about putting everything in practice. We really are having to do that tonight with this. This is ridiculous. Okay, so as I was saying, we're very, very lucky. I don't know, the, the Wi-Fi tonight is very bad. Um, we were, yeah, we're just talking about, yes, yeah, so we're very lucky that we were able to have this relationship with the Saxes. And lots and lots of people have paid, paid tribute, obviously, to Rabbi Sachs, to his phenomenal knowledge and his inspiration that he gave to everybody. But on a personal level, and actually I've seen a lot of people write about it on social media, the relationship that Rabbi Sachs and um, Lady Elaine Sachs had really sort of mimics, I think, in my mind, the relationship that we see with Adam and Chava, that they are a, to a total unit and they supported each other and they always look for the good in each other and they, and they were there as a support network for each other. And I just saw a really lovely story on social media, which I'll just share that Rabbi Gideon Black posted he was um he was the JLIC the chaplain in NYU when Rabbi Sachs used to go and give um shirim or talks or lectures in NYU and he he says that you know one time he got this phone call very panicked phone call from Rabbi Sachs it was very unlike him and he says Gideon I'm stuck I'm lost I don't know where you where you are I don't know where the university is I don't know what to do and he basically got himself totally lost in downtown Manhattan and it's been there knows it's not like a grid like the rest of Manhattan it's a bit confusing and he got himself totally and utterly lost and then Gideon Rabbi Black says that the reason why um, he was so lost is because that was the one time that Elaine Lady Elaine was not with him that was the time that he'd gone by himself because Elaine had to be in London for a simcha. And I think that really epitomized their, their relationship. Every time that we were with them, it was always them as a couple. And it, it was beautiful to see that relationship. And I think um, it just made me think about when, uh, when I was finishing preparing for the year about how 
to constantly surround ourselves with people that make us be successful. And again, just want to reiterate when um, Rabbi Lionel Rosenfeld spoke in his Hespers about his friend, really, about Rabbi Sachs, he said at the beginning, he, the first thing he said was that, I don't think anything, you, I don't think you would have done what you would have done if it wasn't for your wife, if it wasn't for the support network that you had. Um, and I think really it's something that we can all learn from. Obviously, he was an incredible teacher and educator and person, but the, having that relationship with another, another human being, whoever it is, a spouse, a friend, a, a parent, whoever it is, to be that kind of person for someone else and to have that for, as for yourself is something that's very, very special.